Me, me. What's going on, everyone? And welcome back to this week's episode of the Meme Meme Nation podcast. I'm here with Jeremy. I'm here with Kletchy. Guys, how y'all doing this week? Man, doing great, Dave. What's going on, man? Can we better, man? Can we better? <laughs> not, not a whole lot. Just, just uh, really questioning what's going on right now. Uh, it's... It's rough. It seems like I guess we can kind of just get into it. I mean, looking at the game from this past week, I thought our defense kind of answered a lot of questions that we had had from the beginning of the season, kind of how good they look. They looked much better than they have to start the year. But uh, it's just the, the offense, man. They just don't – something's not clicking. Something doesn't look right, you know? Yeah. Um, today when we were at work, uh, Caleb showed me a graphic, man, and it said that we were – I think it was ranked like 119th and average air yards per pass. And I was like, okay, that does, that actually makes a lot of sense because you could just kind of sense that watching the game that our offense just is nowhere near as explosive as it normally is. Yeah. Yeah, and I just thought that stat right there was like the the truth be told and, you know, we really got to start, start airing it out a little bit, make it easier on everybody. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you're breaking in a new quarterback and we, I mean, I, I felt like there was a lot of good, good signs early on, like the first, second quarter. But by the third quarter, you know, we had, what, only one one touchdown in the fourth quarter after after the half, the first half. Um, and so I felt like – I still feel like, you know, McCarron is, is maybe still kind of getting, getting his legs under him. Um, and I feel at the same time, too, like, you know, obviously we don't have, like, we'll sign these guys, but I feel like we're also kind of being very predictable in our plays. And so while we can maybe push our way through in the first half, it always seems like in the second half, like the defense has us figured out and they're able to really just like, you know, close us up really quickly. Yeah. I mean, I understand it's a new quarterback and getting him broken and everything like that, but it's been, what has been five weeks now. Yeah. I, I mean, he's either the guy or he's not at this point, you know, like you either got to let him go and let him do his thing or get someone new in there. Like, cause my thing is it's been five weeks it's not like the guy's a true freshman. He's he's a, a redshirt sophomore, junior. Redshirt sophomore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, he's been around college football. He knows what he's doing. I feel like at some point you just got to take the leash off and just let it go. I mean, it's not working up to this point. Yeah. I mean, what what more is it going to hurt to allow him kind of the freedom and let him throw the ball? I mean, it, it can't hurt any more than it already has throughout this year. And so I mean, it's like you said, when you're 119th in air yards, like the dude's only throwing. The screen passes, he'll throw maybe throw three yard outs. They're not they're not moving the ball forward. It's more sideways. And I feel like that's that's not a recipe for success in college football. Yeah. You look at a lot of the yeah. offenses nowadays, dudes are throwing for three and four hundred yards like it's nothing in college football nowadays. So I mean, I feel like I'm not saying he's gotta go out and throw for four hundred yards every game, but you gotta at least let him air the ball out a little bit, you know? Yeah, I mean Kalechi, you played you played football like when you started out. Did you feel like there was like a certain amount of weeks or even even like years before you felt like, OK, I'm super confident or at least I'm willing to like go all out and do what I need to do? Or do you feel like you, you kind of agree with what David's saying where it's like, hey, class kind of out. You, you kind of have to make a decision now. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I would say uh, for me, at least I know after my first like full year starting that following year, that was when I had the probably the most confidence I've ever had. So, you know, I feel like this year is just going to – I mean, we knew coming in it was a really tough schedule. Um, they ended up losing all the games, you know, we thought they were going to lose. Um, and, you know, just speaking on the adjustments for this game, um, I think Coach Trailers probably saw how well our defense was playing, and he didn't want to go out and just make any mistakes and was really just trying to lean on those guys. Um, we had, you know, some guys making some huge, huge, huge plays, man. Uh, Zay Frazier. Mm-hmm. Two picks. I mean, and both of them were just extremely good plays. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I think that's what was just going on. He was probably just adjusting to the flow of the game. Uh, really thought it was probably going to be a really low scoring game, and just didn't want to make any mistakes. Because mm -hmm. um, I know that you know we've done that before in the past for sure uh, when our offense was kind of struggling. Mm -hmm. But I think I think our our team showed that we're right in that in the mix. Um, I don't know where in that mix, um, yeah. but just right now, it definitely just feels like we're like a, you know, middle of the pack. Right. Um, just, a, you know, just just like every other American team, I would say. And that was what I took from the game. Um, 
but yeah, man, we, we, I know we have a really bright future. Um, a lot of young guys making plays, Jamel Hardy at receiver. I mean, mm-hmm. first career touchdown, a one handed catch insane. Yeah. Um, you know, so the future is definitely bright, but I think right now it's just, it's those grinding stage and we just gonna have to live with these growing pains. Mm-hmm. So I, I am kind of curious. So I, you were, you were a, a defensive back. And so, I mean, I feel like safety, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, so for you, I feel like maybe it's a little bit different being like when when you were starting and kind of getting your groove, right. But as a quarterback, you're supposed to be the leader, like you're the, you're the captain of the offense. So do you think it's maybe something to where the quarterback, maybe he's got to mature a little quicker. He's got to have that kind of, all right, I got to go out and lead this team right away. And do you think that's more something they're not letting him do that? Or do you think it's just the way the game plan is working out things like that? Kind of what, what is your thought when it comes to that? Honestly, I think I think Owen is doing just fine. Um, it's kind of hard looking at like our team from the past few years, just because I mean we had Frank and Frank was a top fifteen quarterback in all of college, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's just it's really hard to to kind of judge them off of that like standard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But but I think uh, Owen's been actually making some really good throws, man. Mm-hmm. I think it's just a combination of his elements, you know, the yeah. uh, some offensive line problems maybe some receiver miscommunications because i mean all our receivers are extremely young yeah. so i think it's just a combination of a lot of things i personally i know owen i mean the dude does not waver in confidence at all so i think he's yeah. pretty confident out there but yeah i think it's kind of what you were saying when we first started man they just got to start giving him some more you know some leeway some more trust in that offense and just you know really trust his arm and let him go make some plays that you know are more than five yards down the field yeah and then kind of going uh, – this is for both of y'all. So, when we're talking about Frank, do you think as a UTSA fan the perception may be a little bit skewed because for the last three to four years while we've had is Frank and we see how good he was as a senior and stuff like that, do you think that maybe skews the perception of kind of what we expect at the quarterback position because of just how good Frank was for us? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think Frank was, you know – I mean, how many years was he here, man? He was here for, like, multiple was- presidencies. Um, okay. But, like, you know, the guy was literally, like, the common denominator. And it was almost like we just expected to have a QB. And I remember back in 2013, you know, back when uh, we were trying to – we just got out of the Sosa era, Eric Sosa, and we were trying to find a QB. And QB was always, you know, our Achilles heel. We couldn't figure that out. And um, having Frank in there – it was just like we were really, really, really spoiled because you have a dual threat QB who's extremely intelligent, extremely athletic. I mean, the guy went through how many surgeries? By the time you know he left, he was like more robot than human. And so yeah. he's like, yeah. you know, I think we really took it for granted. And I think right now, um, even outside of that, the QB situation, we, we've just been really spoiled the past few years, you know, being yeah. conference contenders, you know, getting a lot of media attention. And I think, I think for me at least, you know, and maybe some of the older fans, Nobody wants to go back to 2013 or 2014 when you're like, you know, the bottom of the barrel. Um, so I think, I, I, I think, you know, the current QB situation, I think, is is in a good place overall. I think a lot of the weapons that he's going to need are going to start coming out. I think uh, JT Clark, did he, he played like one or two snaps, right? The last yeah, game? He played, he played 10. Mm-hmm. Nice. Cool. Yeah. So I think, you know, once he starts getting in there and, you know, he starts being like a first string, like I think, that's going to be a huge weapon for him. Um, and I think right now, by we could not have come at a better time. It's time to rest. It's time to recover. And then, you know, the next two games we have, it's like Rice, Florida Atlantic, um, pretty – not not super difficult matchup. Um, but I think it will give him, hopefully, if he approaches it the right way, give him confidence he needs because that last home stretch is going to be pretty pretty rough. Memphis and then Army, who we always have – we always yeah. have issues with. So, Yeah. And I think also it comes down to, like, if you look at our team this year compared to previous years, our team, especially the last, like when we won those back-to-back conference championships, our team was very old in a, in a college sense. There was a lot of veterans, a lot of guys that had been there and kind of knew the system, knew knew kind of how college well worked. And now we you're pretty, putting out a really young team this year comparatively to what we've had in the past. And so I think – that makes it really hard. Cause I mean, think about a lot of those, a lot of the guys we had leave were starters. Like they were 
all conference players. And so, I mean, whenever you got someone to try and come in and fill those shoes, it's, it's not going to be a, an immediate, like, okay, we're not going to be able to churn out that all the time. Like there's going to be years where, Hey, they just need time to grow and develop and learn game sense versus just practice reps. And so I think, I think that's one thing that gives me hope as a UTSA fan. Cause even now there is spots of optimism. Like you said, with Zay Frazier, uh, Devin, guys like that, like they're, they're shining lights in where we're at right now. And I think mm-hmm. you give those guys the time to mature and the time to, cause again, it's, it's different in practice versus a game. The, the speed, yeah. everything is just so different. And, and so I think whenever you're, you're giving those guys the game reps, they're just going to get better with time. No, yeah, I agree, man. And, and you were talking about how game reps are, are different than practice reps. That is 100% true. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what's the, been the most difficult part about this season is we want to see, like, this super fast development. We want to see, you know, Owen's uh, development go like this. But yeah. in reality, in reality, during the season, there's it's very, very, very small tweaks. You know, there's not a lot of change. So yeah. I would say, you know, the big change is always going to be in the off seasons. Um, and just like uh, just like in the past, man, it's really hard to win when you're young. Yeah. And exper- experience in college football, it, experience in college bad. football is everything. Yeah, mm-hmm. it really does. Um, especially when you're going on the road. Like we went on the road in East Carolina. Super hostile territory, great atmosphere, you know, like mm-hmm. that's not an easy game to win. 100%. And yeah, and it, it is just really hard to to get all those those young guys bought in on the road and you know, understand his business trips and things like that. So yeah, just this season, man, I haven't given up hope. Um I know those last three games you mentioned are, are gonna be just slug fest and mm-hmm. army looks really, really good right now. They're undefeated. <laughs> um, yeah, so I definitely think that might be our toughest game. Uh, Army forward. and Navy. Mm-hmm. They're both undefeated for the first time since like 1950, <laughs> which is kind of wild to me because think about how if, if if they both stay, even stay one lost teams, imagine the implications the Army-Navy game could have. No. Think about, that game's already one of the biggest games of the year. Think about if it's got even like – because it's very real possibility that it could have playoff implications. It's yeah. a very real possibility at this moment in time that that game could have serious playoff implications. Yeah, so I, man. And yeah, then those are those are some tough games to play, man. Really exciting. I'm and, just glad and, playing them at West Point because I don't think we've yeah. ever won when they came to the Alamo Dome. No. I, I yeah. Don't think <laughs> I don't know what it's it kind of like a home game for them. They always have all the military appreciation. That's true. And, <laughs> yeah, they, I mean, we had. I remember they had scored a touchdown one time. We played them in the dome, and it was going crazy. I'm like, <laughs> man. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I, <laughs> and I remember. Uh, I remember the last time we played them in the dome. Just kind of going off topic. Last time we played them in the dome, we were watching their their little pregame. And normally in pregame, you know, we're throwing the ball around, doing like DB drills. Those guys were practicing cut blocks before a game, like full speed reps. It was insane. I'm like, yeah, these these guys are a little bit different, man. I mean, for like, you definitely have like a better pulse than any of us do. But whenever I watch the army, like the army games against UTSA, especially, it seems like for a lot of teams, once you hit the third fourth quarter, that stamina, like especially the offense, starts to die down. But the army is just like they keep bulldozing you. I don't know where the energy yeah. comes from. It's just like they don't. They don't stop. And it's not like they're even doing, from what I've seen at least, it's not like you're doing like super complex, crazy plays. They're literally just bashing you across the mouth and trying to run it in. No, yeah. This, <laughs> this the, the kings of the triple option, man. And, I mean, it's just such a tough, tough offense to stop. Um, I can speak on the – I want to say it was maybe 2020 or 2019 we played them. And, I mean, they had a fullback. I'm pretty sure – he just graduated last year. I, I know he who was, you're talking about. He's like 240. Man, he was yes. 280. <laughs> Huge. And for his, I remember we were looking at our scouting report for his career. He had zero uh, loss of games. Like he never had a tackle for loss his entire yes. career. I hear you talking about. So, so I remember uh, there was one play we thought we had him for a TFL and we were all up celebrating. Are you guys and, and then Buchanan? Hmm? Is his name Jacoby Buchanan? Yes, Buchanan. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yep, that's him. Yeah. Man, and I remember we thought we had him for a TFL. It was a fourth down. It was like fourth and inches. And we get up, we're celebrating. And they had like barely got the first down or something like that. And the fullback got up and he's like, let's go. 
<laughs> it was like, man, like these dudes, man, just a machine, man. And <laughs> and what's really hard about Army is they have a really good wide receiver. Um, I can't from, remember his name, but their their ex receiver is really really good. So as much as like we wanted to just stop the run, they had a real receiving threat, like a real deep threat. And yeah. I think that's why they're just so tough to stop. Right, like particularly right now, is because man, they have they have the deep threat to go along with the rushing attack. So you can't just leave your corners out there on an island thinking, you know, you can stop 10, stop the run with 10 guys. No, you're going to have to give him a little help, man, because that receiver, he is real. I, I think that's the most interesting thing with Army because you know, most of the time with Army, they don't really have a, a speed back. That, that's not really in their, in their playbook as a speed back. Most of the guys, they seem like running the ball or look like linebackers. Like <laughs> they're, they're linebackers running the football. And so, I mean – no matter what, when when you have the bigger guys they do up front, and then you got a, a 250 pound dude running the football, like that's not easy to stop. And then when out of nowhere they can pull it away from him and drop 20 on you, I mean that's pretty lethal, pretty hard yeah. to stop. No, yeah, man, they're 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 a tough group to stop, man. Definitely one of the toughest offenses you face. Your game plan for the week, practice, everything is way different. Yeah. Yeah, it's just that's a different game. You gotta for sure come with your mind right. Yeah, and so when I'm when I'm looking at this year, so we're two and three to start the year. Well, looking at the rest of the schedule, what do you look like? Is like what does a successful season look like to you? Is it just a bowl a bowl game? Is it we're gonna win? We're gonna only have two losses coming in. Kind of what what do you what are you thinking? I, I feel would like, say go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. okay. Yeah, I would I, say. I, I, yeah, sorry, man. <laughs> I would say, yeah, man, like this year, I wouldn't even try and like shoot for a particular like amount of wins. I would just say we wanted to see a certain way. Like mm -hmm. we can go and we can play, you know, Army and it'd be we lose by three points. But as long as we looked good and, you know, we look like we're trending in the right direction. Mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest thing on how successful this season will be. Yeah, yeah man, I feel like we're. A lot. We we we're a lot better than we look. I feel like uh, we have a lot of the piece, pieces in place. I mean, look at our defense; they're phenomenal. And I think if we can just get you know get that offense rolling and figure out how to manage under an UQB, um, I think we have the weapons we need. Even from even though a lot of those guys are new, you know, you still got guys like you know Oscar. You got you know JT Clark coming in. And so you got a lot of offensive weapons that, you know, once that really starts to get a flow, um, I, I think you can see a lot of really cool things. And I think um, the biggest thing right now is I feel like we just keep, like, at least outside of the Texas game, I feel like we're, like, stealing victory from the Jaws. I mean, stealing defeat from the Jaws of victory a lot of times. We're doing, like, a lot of penalties. We're playing very sloppy. We're, you know, like he mentioned before, we're not letting – letting Owen really throw the ball and, and we're doing all these lateral kind of gimmick passes that end up costing us yardage. And I think if you can really kind of get that figured out, which I, I don't think is something that's going to take like a whole season to do, um, depending on obviously how Army plays, I, I think we're still in the running for potentially, you know, a conference contender. Um, obviously, I'm somebody who drinks the Kool-Aid every season, but I think at the bare minimum, I think, you know, we can definitely hit a bowl, but – um, I, I don't necessarily view this as like a rebuilding, rebuilding year. I think it's a refining year. Um, yeah. We've got some old players in, in 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 place that I think we should respect and give them their flowers. And I think uh, it's just we got to just kind of tie up those those knots. And I think really get our confidence back because I think we have a team that's very used to winning. And to lose, you know, obviously you're going to lose to Texas, but to lose to Texas State, right? And then to have another loss to e ECU. That stuff's got to get in your head, and so you kind of got to shake that off. But um, yeah, I, I feel pretty pretty confident. I think you know a lot of these small things we just got to figure out, and I think we'll be in a in a competitive place in our conference. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and I kind of want to move into stuff. I think we're I think kind of since it's a bye week this week, it's not much to talk about game wise. I wanted to talk to kind of college football news and things that we've seen. So so far, there's a few things I want to talk about. I guess we'll start with first off, we have. Texas State saying they're not going to go to the Mountain West, and we have UTSA saying they're not going to go to the Pac-12. And I want to talk about that a little bit because I know kind of the biggest thing that I thought was, first off, the buyout was going to be way too expensive, especially considering UTSA just came to the American. Mm -hmm. And from what I saw, it was like a $25 million buyout, and the Pac-12 was only going to cover $5 million of it. <laughs> and, and 
And so, like, there was no chance UTSA was ever going to pay that. And not only that, it's not like they were going to go to a prestigious Power Five conference. The Pac-12 is going to be no more than a group of five, uh, a group of five conference anymore. <laughs> no, yeah, I think the Pac-12 is the new like American conference. Um, I think it's that next step right below Power Five. The Power Four is going to yeah. be that Pac-12 squad. Um, but I actually – I think that's probably what's ended up being best for us anyway. We we probably do need to just stay in the American. Um, just got that new deal going in. I think it's a great opportunity. Um, definitely a chance, too, for kind of us to catch up to to the field in terms of, you know, recruiting all that money we, we're going to need for NIL and things like that. Because I think just going to the Pac-12 too prematurely maybe could have been a bad thing for us. And, you know, yeah. just not being able to compete with recruits and – you know, and keeping our guys, especially. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, I would have been really worried if like Memphis, Tulane and, you know, USF left because mm. that would really knock the power of the American down. I think right now the way our conference stands I, and especially with the way Army's doing, I think, you know, we're kind of neck and neck with the pack right now with the way it is. Um, but my biggest worry was obviously, you know, you heard a lot of talks about how the pack wanted to basically have Tulane, Memphis, and, and USF as a, as a group come together, and they were trying to basically get UTSA coming in outside of that. And uh, that, for me, would, would have been really worrying because I think if those three teams left, we would basically be in CUSA again <laughs> for the most yeah. part. Um, so I think right now we're definitely in a good place. And for me, even outside of, like, the buyout and all, I think in the back of my head, and we talked about this in the last podcast, it's just like the toll it's going to take on the players. Like, it is not going to be fun to travel to Oregon and to all these places every other week. And it's just like, I think even for other schools that have bigger budgets too, I think in the next few years, they're going to realize like, dude, this is just not, it's not good. It's not mentally sustainable for for anybody, uh, especially student athletes. And so yeah. it'll be interesting to see what happens. But I think, um, you know, I think, especially the way the bot was, was structured. Like I was, you were hearing all these rumors like, Oh, you know, they're going to cover everything. They're going to give us like, you know, hundred billion dollars. It's like, nah, dude, they, they, they were really, really desperate. And so I think, um, I think we're in a good place. I think we just got to keep trucking along. And, um, you know, I think right now, if we were to move into a bigger conference, maybe, you know, look at something like the big 12, uh, something of that nature. But I think that's going to be, you know, years down the line right now, it's really facilities, facilities, facilities like, that's the biggest thing for us is like our football team is carrying a lot of that, that, I guess, you know, reputation for the school. And so, um, which is awesome. That's cool. And obviously we have the Alamo and all, but man, dude, I don't know, like the people who are listening, how many of you guys are familiar with the facilities UTSA has? I know of like high schools in Katy and Houston that have facilities that are like, you know, double and triple the size of us. So that's not to hit on UTSA. I think we're headed down the right direction. You know, we've got this whole new medical system that we're we're working with now, and you know, things are going on in the right place. But man, we got to get get building before we we really really think about leaving. No, I agree, and it it's hard because like I look at other sports too, like especially basketball, because that's kind of the next biggest thing. Yeah. When you're competing against the team, like even just say Memphis, like they got Penny Hardaway as a coach, they play in the FedEx Forum. Like that, that makes it hard when you're competing against schools like that for basketball recruits. And again, I'm, I'm not trying to take anything away from UTSA, but they call it the historic convo. <laughs> I think that's just a way for them, a way for them to market <laughs> well, what's on campus. Cause again, I'm not saying it's not fun to go watch games and stuff like that, but dude, like you see high school gyms and some of these bigger schools that are nicer than that. Yeah. And so how, how is, it's hard for a basketball coach to be able to recruit kids to play there. Mm-hmm. Like, like when, when you're playing in a gym that looks like most schools practice gyms, mm-hmm. it, it's hard. And, and I, I think they're making some upgrades with, with baseball and softball, which are good. Um, upgrading Park West a little bit, which is going to be good. And so I think everything's trending in the right direction. But I honestly think the next step is going to be a new basketball arena. Because, again, I think – I think that's what the next biggest thing that they're going to need is, is, is to kind of upgrade that or make it, I don't know. Cause everything in there just still feels very historic, uh, <laughs> old. Yeah. very old in there. And, and so it, it doesn't create the best atmosphere for, for games just because like yeah. I said, everything in there feels so old. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, dude, you probably have asbestos in the walls for, for all you know, like <laughs> the whole, whole building. Um, I wanted to also talk about that, uh, and I don't know, Kletch, you might have more information on it, but I know the indoor practice facility was something they were talking about ever since they, you know, built the new the new um, uh, accelerant facility on the main campus. But is there any updates on that? Because I know they've been talking about that for a long time for football. Yeah, we really thought it was good. Coach Taylor thought it was supposed to be done last summer. Mm -hmm. And yeah, apparently there's like a, a standstill right now because they're they're trying to wait for all these other sports. Cause I'm guessing the other sports were saying that football was getting uh everything done for them and whatever. So they yeah. were just pausing the uh, construction on that and covering the field and whatnot until they were finished uh some of the other projects going on. Because I know they were – I know right now, or I think maybe this winter, I think they're about to start construction on a new basketball mm -hmm. and volleyball practice facility right there connected to the race. I yep. think that's the next kind of thing for them was a new practice facility for those teams, which is good. I think, again, that's another step in the right direction. David, how were the uh, golf facilities for you when you were playing at UTSA? I'm going to be so <laughs> honest with you. I There is zero complaints. We Our golf team – it was 30 minutes away from campus. That's about the only thing that was wrong, but it's top tier tour level practice facilities, tour level golf course. It's at a JW Marriott with, so it's Ooh. always just absolutely perfect out there. Like there are zero complaints when it comes to the golf side of things. It was, nice. it was absolutely amazing. Hey brother, sounds like we need an invite. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another thing I wanted to talk about is how good is that Ashton Jean T? The running back from Boise State, he's put up almost a thousand yards in the first five games with with touchdowns. I think he had a four touchdown game or something like that. No, yeah, he's he's the real deal. I think it's uh, Genty. Genty, Genty, that's what it is. That's what. And it is. man, yeah, I mean, I was I'm always skeptical at first when guys just come out of nowhere onto the yeah. scene, but man, after watching him and uh, we our running backs coach, they always they call it BYOB, bring your own blocker. So the way that they'll block it up is they'll block it up. They'll account for every man, and there's going to be one guy that the running back accounts for. So it's BYOB, bring your own blocker. He accounts for a lot of blockers. He <laughs> makes at least four to five guys miss every single play. And that's how I know he's going to be a really good back at the next level too because, man, he's just really good at breaking tackles. That dude's been nuts. Like just seeing, yeah. seeing his stats and even this year seeing Ryan Williams from Bama. He's 17 years old and is one of the best wide receivers in college football. Like, can someone explain that to me? Man. I mean, that Ryan Williams play had me screaming in my oh, room like, like I'm Bama at the game, game or something. Oh, yeah, like I'm a Bama goodness. fan. I'm over here screaming. Like, <laughs> insane play, insanely talented player, man. <laughs> Nuts. I would hate to see him in a couple years. I would hate to see him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because, I mean, doesn't he have to wait? I think he has to wait two years. Is it two years to enter the draft? Three years. Three years. Yeah. Like, can you imagine that dude at Alabama for another three years? <laughs> Man, he still has his – yeah, he still has his high school body too. That's the scary yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Once he puts on that college muscle and put gets on a college weight program, that dude's going to be <laughs> scary. And then also I saw on Twitter, I don't know if you guys seen it, but uh, FIU just released some new uniforms this week for their game. Their, their Vice U uniforms, those things, those things look sick. No, yeah, me and uh, me and some of the my old teammates, uh, me T Haynes, Tremaine, we have a, a Twitter group chat. Uh -huh. um, T Haynes, T Haynes is a huge Jersey guy, and yes. he sent in the the Miami Vice ones, and I'm like, man, those are so nice. He <laughs> said, yeah, these are my favorite uniforms. We have played, we played there. Um, I want to say when they did like the little Miami night or whatever it was. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Man, it was so nice. Even their field is really nice. Yeah, yeah, I saw those uniforms, and I was like, yeah, they. They got something going on right there. Nice. Yeah, they had something going on there. I, I think it I, I always find it interesting because I feel like you have certain schools that are that are like those are their colors. Like you look at a Penn State, Bama, Georgia, they're not really changing up a ton because they're they're so iconic with their colors. Same thing with like Notre Dame. They're they're so iconic with those colors and the gold helmets. Like they're not really gonna change that. But I think for a school, I like even say like UTSA or like like other schools, like UTSA came out with the all black uniforms. Mm -hmm. I think that was a that was a good step in the right direction. But I think that helps the smaller schools 
gain some exposure because everyone loves a good uniform. Like mm -hmm. when um, Houston did the when y'all played Houston, they did the the Oiler the Oilers. Colors. Yeah, I think that makes a big difference when it comes to the smaller schools, the smaller markets, because it makes people want to watch the game just to see the uniforms in action. You know? No, yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I think it's such a big thing for those smaller schools because, again, like you said, like once you see – because I know there's a bunch of Twitter accounts that, that post stuff like that and they, they post the uniforms whenever someone comes out with something new. Mm -hmm. So that makes people want to tune in because they're like, oh, I want to see those. I want to see how they play, things like that. And I oh. think that's big help for small market teams. I mean, even like, uh, like Boise, right? Like they paint their, their field blue, right? Yeah. For, yeah. And that's yeah. like they're not a big team, but like – People know they're Boise because that's what they do, and so I think the same mentality applies when you're when you're playing with these unique uniforms. Mm, I think uh, I think Eastern Michigan is gray. I think Eastern Michigan has a gray field, mm -hmm. and I, I, for some reason, I, I'd like to think someone had a red field. I don't know. That could have been something I just seen, but I, I think that's also a cool way to kind of make yourself known is to do something crazy like that. And so I don't know. I always I always like the the creativity I see in college football because in the NFL you don't get it a ton. It's all kind of the same yeah. stuff. But whenever college teams do things like that, I, I've always wished UTSA would do something like I've always thought like the the old Spurs colors like that teal and pink and mm -hmm. orange, mm -hmm. doing something like that where you do a collaboration with the Spurs yes. and do colors like that. I've always thought that'd be such a good idea. Yeah, I remember um, one year for spring game, we had the the Hispanic Heritage helmets with the the, yeah. bur the dang, I want to say it was Rowdy on the helmet was yeah. like the Hispanic Heritage because it was so nice. And I yeah. think that might be like the jersey combo that we could do. Like we bring back those helmets, we get some nice yeah. colors going for them with it. Yeah. I think that would be really nice because I remember we had his Hispanic Heritage, I want to say either last year or two years ago. We had so many, so many fans really like dive into that and, and like show on game day like how they express all their. I don't know how to say it, but like they were just really big fans of the moment and really big fans of like the Hispanic Heritage Month. So we yeah. had so many fans, so so much support like during that time. I know if we get a jersey for like Hispanic Heritage Month, I know it would do really well in San Antonio. Yeah. The helmets that they had for that, did they auction those off, or do we still have that? Well, I still have mine. I'm not sure where the rest of them are. <laughs> <laughs> I know uh, one of the – I swear this is when I was being recruited maybe because this would have been 20 – maybe 2017, 2018. Y'all went with the all black and the black helmet. I think it was a black helmet. That might have even been yeah. older. That, that was around like when Josiah was there. Yeah, it was like a year was before of, I got there. Twenty. Yeah, they went to all black with the. I think it was black with an orange face mask or something like that. And it was it was chrome. Chrome, yes, it was the chrome, <laughs> chrome orange. Man. And I know I always see people on Twitter saying we want that back because again, so I think fans get really invested in uniforms because again, you, you see, I think even the NFL they did it whenever the color rush happened. Everyone got really involved with the color rush. I think when you see teams do those special like one-off uniforms, I think people get excited about it because it makes people talk about their school. Like it makes people talk and be like, oh, hey, like everyone's going to be talking about those uh, FIU uniforms on Saturday. Just like – and I think it even – when Houston did the Oilers uniforms, I think there was some controversy because I think people were saying that that should be Tennessee, not Houston. Because <laughs> I think Tennessee – they were the Houston Oilers and then moved to Tennessee and became the Tennessee Titans. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it was. And so I think they were, they created controversy. But again, even though it's controversy, people were talking about their school. So I think that's a I think that's such an attention getter when it comes to football. And I know yeah. I know it makes I know it makes the players feel good. Because I know when y'all get something new and you it's the look good, feel good, play good, you know? Like know. when you yeah, when you absolutely. feel confident, when you like what you're wearing, I think I think it creates <laughs> that little extra bit of a swagger of confidence that, that you go out there and play with. Yeah, maybe. yeah, absolutely. I was looking forward to wearing those black uniforms. They had them all laid out for us on all our visits <laughs> and made sure we taking all our uniform pictures in the all black. I'm like, man, I can't wait to wear those. <laughs> right when we get there, right when we get there, I remember um, it was me, uh, Sheldon Jones, we call him Sticks. It was me, Sticks, and somebody else. And we were all in Coach Wilson's office. Mm -hmm. And he had just, they had just sold all the black uniforms at some auction. 
And he's like, yeah, we just we just sold all the black ones, babe. And I'm like, what? Like, why would we do that? But <laughs> it's because that's how, yeah, that's, that's how much we needed the money back then. Like, we yeah. literally sold our best uniforms. Uh, yeah, I think there's just so much you just you can do because I think, like, this, I mean, the only reason we're able to play on the level we, we're at is because of the assets the city has to offer us, like the Alma Dome and, and all of that. And I think, you know, we always talk about, oh, when is when is the city going to buy in to the team and all that? And I think, you know, ultimately that just takes time winning and all. But I think by really embracing that kind of stuff, even though it might seem superficial, like you said, you know, the fans get excited about that. They feel invested in it. And even if you don't maybe feel a direct connection to UTSA because you weren't like an alum, like, you know, San Antonio at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's a predominantly Hispanic city. It's got a lot of history here. And so I think if you really try to ingrain that within – how we carry ourselves, whether that's like our uniforms or whatnot. I feel like people who live in San Antonio, even though they don't have any affiliation with the university, are going to feel at least somewhat invested automatically. That's why I thought with the Spurs thing, because then you bring in kind of that Spurs side of things. People that don't really watch football say they just watch basketball. That mm-hmm. brings in that whole different side of the fan base when you're coming into to Spurs fans, because then they're going to be like, oh, I want to watch that. I've always no. thought – that one would be a good idea. And then I've also thought of that. We have the Alamo in San Antonio. How have right. how there never been uniforms that have even like the Alamo on one side and the bird on the other side? I don't know, like yeah. something with the Alamo. Like that's one of the most historic things in Texas history. And I think it, it, the first few helmets we had, and I don't know, Kalechi, if they got rid of it when you got there, but I know back in like 2014, 2015, like the first time we played Houston, um, there were the whiteout uniforms with the white helmets. And the back was like a gold Alamo emblem. Mm. But I don't know if they have that anymore. But that was like one of my favorites. It was like the white helmet with the orange chrome uh, front. And it was just like, looks super clean. Yeah, that's, that's before me. <laughs> yeah. Before yeah, that was like 2014. <laughs> Show, showing your age a little bit there, Jeremy. <laughs> I'm going to be in a month. You know, I'm freaking out. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh. All right, uh, y'all got anything else? Um, I want to give a shout out, special shout out to the UTSA wide receivers, man. That is an extremely talented room. I know we can't really see that right now. I just want to say firsthand, I have seen them every day. That is a group right there. Um, I think we have a true wide receiver pipeline. Um, I think we're getting the best receivers out of Houston, um, East Texas. Because every receiver we've gotten from there, man, they have been really, really good. Mm-hmm. And I just can't wait to keep watching them over the years. So, yeah, just shout out UTSA wide receivers. Right. Jeremy, you got anything? Yeah, man. I mean, I think, uh, you know, fans, players, servers listening, like things seem a lot worse than they really are. I think we're really on the precipice of, of, of getting back to where we should be. And I think, uh, you know, if you're a fan, team definitely needs your support. I know for sure the players I've talked to – means a lot when you guys show up. And so I think uh, that that's really beneficial for the team. I think for a longevity purpose, I mean, I, I know right now at least, like the last game, um, the last home game we had, despite, you know, losing to Texas State, student section still showed out. And so I think that kind of shows the overall culture is starting to shift now where even though things can seem bad and some of those old heads like us kind of think about back when nobody showed up at the games, Definitely feels like the culture is changing, and so I definitely encourage you guys to keep supporting the team. You know, we're we're really right on the precipice of, of turning things around and going back to that upwards trajectory. And then, as far as the players go, man, you know, like like you know, like Clutch, Clutch you said, like there's so many so many talented guys on there, and I think uh, you know you can't you got to shake off those losses. You don't want to get to you. Conference play is just starting. It's a clean slate. Um, everything we want to try to achieve, I think, is still in front of us if we if we just put our best foot forward. No, I agree with both yeah, of you guys. Saying. Yeah, I think I think uh, kind of my last piece is I think things seem kind of bleak right now just because, I mean, it's a new season. We've been so used to the, the undefeated as the one-loss seasons, but it's not going to happen like that every year. We're, it's just not it's not how college football works. And so I think I think even though things down, it, it things are looking up, especially from kind of where we started. And so I think everyone just needs to stay committed and it, it's going to go our way. I think just, just keep that mindset and just keep pushing on, you know. Thanks. Uh, but thank you guys for tuning in this week. Uh, we'll catch you guys next week after the bye week and we'll be ready to talk about uh, rice. So thank you guys for tuning in. See you all next time. Birds up. Yes.
Mimi. <laughs>